uh, Tame Grass Conference, I was asked to speak on limit feeding stalker cattle, which perhaps may not fit in exact that type of a, a topic for today. But what I've got here is just a, a broad overview of our state, looking at the precip from the extreme southeast east, all the way up into the northwestern portion of our state. And those black lines essentially represent the growing, de growing days, the kind of season that we anticipate. So we've got a lot of variation out there in terms of our capabilities for producing grass. And certainly what you folks do down in this neck of the woods is dramatically different from what is even possible out in the western part of the state. Hence, uh, limit feeding in terms of the, the variability, the unpredictability of precipitation. And I know that's hard to say. I was reminded that you folks have experienced upwards of 17, 18 months of wet, wet weather down in this neck of the woods. But I, I think you guys have had drought here in the past, not too long ago, if I'm not too far off on that. And of course, the, uh, the, the issues around that, I think, might perhaps lend itself to what we're going to talk about. But, you know, in Kansas, in eastern Kansas, about 20% of the time, if you define drought as years with less than two-thirds average annual precip, you guys have that experience about, well, 20% of the time. And as you go out further west, it's more likely around 30% of the time. So we, we have to build that into our management and our approach to both crops as well as livestock as we try to make some long-term plans. Uh, as Chris alluded to, this is a, a picture of the, of the stalker unit located just outside of, of Manhattan, Kansas. It's about five miles from campus, so that really allows us to utilize. Uh, we have a lot of undergraduate students. In fact, right up here on this hill here, which is pretty ugly right now, well, we just built a two-bedroom student apartment. Uh, and we provide a place for the kids to live. Of course, we give it to the good ones, the ones that show up to work. Uh, the ones who are willing to take care of things, uh, that's kind of a reward. So, so we've been very fortunate there, and we are also in the process of adding another eight pens, or so we'll have a total of 40 pens for our facility to do work of the nature that I'm going to share with you today. So we start talking about calves, getting them on feed, dry matter intake is what drives the whole equation from health as well as performance. I think we all appreciate that. And so one thing when we do bring in calves, especially if we have no known history on these animals, is we do not want to potentially compound stress on these calves. And so that, that's one of the things that stays in the back of our minds as we develop research. And certainly as we go back, uh, some work from Amarillo, Drs. Hutchinson and Cole in 86, I, I, this slide shows very, very uh, well the impact of calves that are sick versus, versus those that are healthy. Simply put, the sick calves just don't eat. Now, one thing I didn't add about the stalker unit uh, when I had that picture up is when, when I developed the stalker unit 15 years ago, in my mind's eye, all of the great work that had been done years ago at Pahuska, Oklahoma, when doctors Don Gill and Bob Smith and some really heavy hitters were doing some really good lightweight starting calf work. That, along with these two gentlemen in Amarillo, I aspired that we needed to have a facility in Kansas to, to really zero in on that because those guys did some really good, good stuff if you go back to their old Oklahoma State beef cattle report. So what we do with our calves upon arrival and when we do work of this nature, we try to use naive calves, and we procure all of our calves out of Dixon, Tennessee. We work very closely with Pratt feeders, because I tell you what, we couldn't afford to put calves in our facility if we weren't working with a commercial sponsor. And so we work with Pratt. They have an order buyer in Dixon, and he pulls calves out of secondary auction markets out of northern Alabama, Tennessee proper, and if necessary, into Bowling Green, uh, Kentucky. Now. One of the nutritional paradigms, if you go back to the literature from Glenn Lofgren out of Clayton, New Mexico, and, and more recently out of Oklahoma State, uh, one of the nutritional paradigms is that as you increase the density of energy in a receiving ration, there is a, te a tendency, if you will, for an increase in sickness and morbidity. Some of the possible causes uh, as you review the literature is as you increase the energetic density of, of the ration, you're removing the roughage and potentially you're adding a fermentable carbohydrate, that being starch. 
and calves that aren't acquainted fully to starch uh, and really not having a good handle on the lever in terms of intake. At that point in time, you perhaps increase the incidence and even severity of subacute and even, even the acute ruminal acidosis. But what we also see as you increase the energetic density in these receiving rations, we also see an increase in performance as well. And, and as a consequence of this, uh, use of high energy diets in receiving protocols a lot of consulting nutritionists will not even touch this one. It's just too risky for them to, to even contemplate trying to get more energy packed in. And unfortunately, it's in the form of highly fermentable feedstuffs such as corn, milo, what have you. Now, what we had done in the past at the stalker unit was implement a three-base approach to our calves as they come on feed. The first week or so, uh, the majority, almost 40%, of what we provided the calves was equally distributed between prairie hay and alfalfa, 30% uh, sweet bran, which is wet corn gluten feed. And then as we progressed further into their feeding period, we got an NAG energy as high as 0.53. And you can see our corn concentration is about 36% when we carry them on through our, our uh, backgrounding period is where we hold them at. Now, uh, limit feeding. It's been around a long time. It's, it's a long-held approach, and, and I, I make sure I put this slide in here. I mean, here's a cover of a proceeding sponsored by Oklahoma State from 1986. And at this conference, uh, um, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Bob Lake gave a presentation on his approach when he was a nutritionist at uh, Hitch Feeders. And so it's been around. I mean, we learned this in grad school, and, and it's just an approach. And, and it, it has a lot of things to it, especially in this environment with labor issues and, and a lot of things. And what I hope, want to hope to share with you today is some of our experiences with respect to limit feeding. It vastly simplifies feed bunk management. Uh, we feed our calves once a day, and by five hours after, those bunks are stripped clean. They're, they're clean. So if we get a rain event or a snow event, there's no scoop shovels involved. There's no nothing. Those, those bunks are, are cleaned up. Now, it does require some appreciation for feed mixing. Uh, I've had some producers ask me if they could do this on grass traps, provide a limited. That's not really limit feeding. You're, you're restricting the intake of what you're providing that animal in one solid mass of feed, if you will. You're rounding out the edges if you're doing the grass traps. But, but there's marketing benefits, and I'm going to share with you some of the environmental aspects of this feeding practice. And I think the health management thing is another one, too, in, in light of this new era of our, our um, antimicrobial uh, concerns, if you will. So the previous research results uh, reduced cost of gain, added flexibility in commodity training, uh, less roughage, and as a consequence, less manure handling, which can be a really big one for a lot of you folks that have to. That, that manure handling is a millstone around producers' necks, and it certainly is ours as well at the stalker unit. We see a decline or decrease in feed wastage, uh, less labor equipment feeding expense, and I also touched on, on marketing. Now, the analogies that I use for folks that perhaps are not familiar with limit feeding, uh, Ad-lib feeding calves, uh, just keeping those bunks full is similar to going to Vegas where you do a little gambling and at 2 o'clock in the morning you want to go to an all-you-can-eat night buffet. And you just eat till you're crazy. I'm sure we all have been in those situations where you just look at food and you just say, I've had enough, no more. Now, contrast that with some of you have been in the military boot camp, how highly structured that basic training is where they get you up, you do your PT, they sit you down for 15 minutes, you eat, you get up and go and go about your business for the day. That's how I like and limit feeding is this Camp Pendleton approach. So limit feeding while increasing dietary energy, what happens is with a reduction in feed intake, the intake, the passage rate of that digesta, that material going through the rumen, it slows down. It's going through the track slower. And as it goes through the site of absorption where a lot of our nutrients are absorbed, there's greater opportunity. And what we tend to see is an improvement in digestibility. 
Now, limit feeding then, I alluded earlier, uh, and this is exactly out of uh, Dr. Lake's report, what hitch feeders approach would be was that they would start their cattle slowly about two weeks post arrival and they were using almost two thirds rolled corn in their limit feeding diet. That's a, lot, that's a lot of starch there, that's a lot of feed there. Cottonseed, alfalfa pellets, and cottonseed. What we're doing is on day one, on arrival, these calves get 1% of their body weight, long stem hay. On day, that's day zero. Day one, we provide the Camp Pendleton diet at 1% of their body weight and increase that a quarter of a percent per day till we top off at about 2.2% of their intake based that's on a dry matter basis on their body weight. What is important about this is high co-product inclusion and that represents about 40% of the dry matter. So we're talking about wet corn gluten feed, wet distillers, works very well. Here's the old diet that the hitch feeders would use, two-thirds corn. Here we're using only 38, 39% corn. Here's our wet, our wet co-product. This is all expressed on a dry matter basis. But we're only at 13% roughage. And when it's all said and done, their NEG concentration is 58, and we're, we've been promoting the 60. And I might add, before I forget to mention this, we've done about eight trials looking at limit feeding with this manner. And we've looked at different approaches in terms of how, how this thing works. And I'll share with you a little bit about what we're doing presently. This is some of our, our first trial work. Uh, uh, had a lot of folks involved, had a lot of good veterinarians. Dr. Hanslicek was on the project. Nagaraja, who's well known, Dr. Nagaraja, at, at, he's in the vet school, but he's a well-known microbiologist. Uh, we had a lot of folks uh, involved with this. And bottom line, we wanted to look at performance of these calves. We wanted to look at health. Of course, digestion. We really wanted to focus on immune function because you wonder if by feeding a higher energy diet, if we're creating some potential health issues in these calves. So, so we really took a hard look at that. We looked at immune function and immunocompetency as well. So what we did was we took 354 crossbred heifers weighing about 477 pounds. Uh, it was a 41 day study uh, with, uh, with a final two week gut equalization period, basically to, to get everything zeroed out on the calves. As I said, these calves come out of Alabama, Tennessee. Uh, we had four treatments. We had an ad-lib diet formulated at 45 NEG. Those calves got all they, they could eat. We read the bunks every morning, and based upon how much those calves ate, we restricted three other treatments at 95, 90, and 85, which is equal to the 60 NEG diet. So this is what the diets look like. Here's the ad-lib diet, almost 45, 45% roughage, a little bit rolled corn, sweet bran, uh, and then as we increase the, den the density of the, of the diet, uh, we really uh, pulled down on the alfalfa prairie hay, much more corn, but we did keep our sweet bran constant across all of the treatments. Uh, here's what happened at the end of that trial. Scabs came in at 490. Average dry matter intake of those ad-lib calves was about 2.6% of their body weight. We, we restricted the 60 NEG, 85% of that, to about 2.25%. Dry matter intake, only a two pound difference, if you will. You look at that and say 14.51 versus 12.51, but just think about it, every mouthful of feed those calves were consuming on that 60 NEG diet had more calories in each mouthful that it consumed compared to mostly roughage over here on that 45 NEG. Average daily gain, we saw an increase in average daily gain and a significant improvement in feed efficiency. That's feed the gain, pounds of feed to, to pounds of gain. So six and a half pounds of feed required on this diet and when we fed the 60 NEG diet, a little bit over five pounds of feed required to convert to one pound of beef. That's about, uh, we'll get to it, about 28%. Now you ask about sickness, yeah, these calves were long-haul calves, and yes, we had some sickness. Uh, across the board, it was not significant. Uh, you could see there, 4%. Uh, no, really, no, there was no significance that we determined uh, in the trial here. And we also looked at a lot of the blood parameters, the haptoglobin and all that stuff. And I, for the interest of the presentation today, I'd be happy to share it with you. But 
we saw no significant impact from the 60 NEG diet. But what we saw was an improvement of feed efficiency of 27% when feeding the 60 NEG diet versus the 45 ad lib. No adverse effects on health were detected from the 60 NEG diet. Okay, so we did a second study. This using, you know, we're training graduate students, and so we use a lot of ruminally cannulated calves. They're learning nutrition, so we, we, they need to get inside and understand the architecture of these calves and everything. So, so we utilized uh, some cannulated calves, 60-day uh, total trial. You can see that there's a period of time in here for adapting to the diet. We pull fecals, and on, on the final end of that trial period, we pull uh, ruminal digesta uh, as well for, for further analysis. Uh, there was a 21-day period before we initiated the trial, uh, and we used the last five days to obtain an average dry matter intake. All right. We pulled fecal samples. Uh, we advanced. We looked at dry matter digestibility. Uh, we, we pulled samples almost every two hours, VFAs, ammonia, pH, all that stuff. Uh, we actually use some, some really cool technology that's available out of Austria, and basically they're, they're boluses that we delivered through the ruminal cannula, the fistula of the animal, and it basically uh, transmits the pH of, of what is inside the rumen. Just like, a, just like a clock, it's got a base station and we collect the data. But you can see on this 60 NEG diet where the pH slides down here to about four, and you can see post, post eating here, we're talking about a four hour period of time, it gets down here to five four, and at this point in time, depending upon who you talk to, you start to get a little bit of concern about where you're, you're moving into that zone of uh, taking out the effectiveness, potential pH issues, if you will. Uh, and you can see that with the, six, the uh, 45 NEG diet, it, it doesn't, I mean, it, it fit very, very well. Uh, VFAs, as we expected, with the higher energy, we got less uh, amounts of acetate, increased amounts of propionate. Um, diet digestibility, a linear response. We saw a very nice improvement in feed efficiency with with the limit feeding uh, as we increase the restriction and the energy of the diet. Okay, nutrient digestibility. Again, here it is, 62 versus 70%. What's interesting is that for the amount of forage that we put into the 60 NEG diet, we really did not see any de decrease in the amount of the fiber that was digested by the ruminal microbes uh, with that higher energy diet. Now. This is a big thing I alluded to earlier about manure handling in terms of weed load, potential soil compaction, and all this stuff. You've got less to deal with. And uh, we've seen this a lot. We can appreciate that, and we all can relate to what happens to pens. Uh, this is just a picture I took, but this, this amount of manure from a limit-fed set of calves uh, is represented from 105 head over a 90-day trial. There's just not much manure produced. And in fact, from our cannulated cattle, we calculated about a 58% reduction in manure. Forage is good, don't get me wrong. I mean, here I am, a ruminant nutritionist, and I'm talking about digestible fiber. But forage is marginally digestible and is a diluent inside the diet. And if it's only marginally digested, it's going to pass through the track, and it's, the animal's going to make manure. Common sense, right? If that, manure, if that feed is more highly digestible, more of it is going to good use for the animal. And what we're seeing here, the fecal dry matter output, 7.5 pounds versus 4.34 pounds. So there's less of a, a, an effect, if you will, in terms of having to deal with manure. And in our case, we, we're surrounded by about 1,100 acres of native grass at the stalker unit. And I don't know how many more years I got left in me for K-State, probably 10, maybe 15, who knows. But I can't go out and put manure on native grass because I'll ruin it for the next generation of researcher that'll be showing up there. So we gotta haul our manure about nine miles. And for us, it costs us a nickel a head a day. And uh, that's what we figured. But full feeding, the amount that we had to, to process, we looked at about a savings of about five cents by limit feeding. 
So all these things start to accrue when you look at limit feeding. And in fact, uh, when you look at the amount of time it re is required to feed and the number of loads to feed, remember, roughage is a diluent, and if you fill up your feeder wagon and 40% of it is roughage, you don't have that capacity to feed as many calves as you do with a more highly concentrated diet. So in terms of time it takes to feed, mixing time, all this stuff, and we're actually doing work right now. We got some monies uh, through NCBA with a sustainability grant. We're actually trying to quantify all these little ancillary benefits that can arise from doing so. And what I have here, uh, we're actually kicking the trial off here next month. We got GoPro cameras right here on the back, uh, on the top of the tractor in here, and we're, we're collecting a lot of the animal behavior aspects. And we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the health, uh, because if you eat and you're fed and you consume everything within five hours, and all you do the rest of the 18, 19, 20 hours of the day is lay around, when it comes time to eat, and that truck tractor comes up to feed you, if you're not up at the bunk looking pretty enthusiastic about eating, that really, I, I believe, and, and it's common sense again, the health detection. And we're going to really try to substantiate that with this next trial. So, adequate bunk space is necessary. You've got to have sufficient space for all calves to have equal opportunity to eat when they, obviously some will eat more than the others if you don't give them that opportunity. Now. Uh, again, with this study we're doing in March is we're going to evaluate this cattle behavior because I tell you, when you start and these calves are hungry, it, it's nerve-wracking. They'll climb out of their pens, literally. Uh, so we want to document that. But as I said, those bunks are slick. They're clean. And I did have some YouTube, and in the interest of time, I, I'm not going to show you, but I flew drones over our bunks Right prior to feeding at about 7.40, we just weighed calves that morning. And they're laying down. They're not mooing or doing anything to give you the impression. But the minute they hear that tractor, uh, they're gathered up. And they're ready to get down to business and eat. Uh, another thing, our observation, our earlier pens that we built were uh, these bunks come out of uh, Garden City. And they're more, we call them a J-bunk because they're shaped, they're rounded in the bottom. Um, with roughage, guess what? You put a lot of roughage in there and stuff. Uh, those calves tend to put their heads in there and they'll flick that feed out pretty quick. That's another thing about feeding a lot of roughage is you start producing a lot of feed uh, for the rodents and for the birds, the predating birds and stuff. We have now gone over to Kinsley and we're using these flat bottom bunks from Straits and we're getting pretty good luck with them. So as I alluded to, the wind losses, uh, fluffy ration, uh, the waste, estimating the, the, the amount of waste. And if it's waste, the animal's not eating it to convert with. And it depends on how you look at that. But, but there's some true costs there to be had. So nine trials and ongoing. Uh, we're seeing about a 27. This last trial we did, it was closer to 30% improvement in feed efficiency. And there's a lot of questions yet to be answered. And, for example, a lot of folks say, well, you guys have been doing a lot of work with Sweet Brand, which is out of Blair, Nebraska. For you folks down here, it just doesn't make sense at all. So how about what distillers? Is there an opportunity for that? So we did a study, followed up with that. These calves come out of, out of Texas and New Mexico, a lot bigger cattle. Uh, we looked at wet distillers versus Sweet Brand, but we also looked at feeding these calves crack corn or whole shelled corn. Here's one other thing to make life a little bit simpler with these, these uh, lighter calves. We've formulated all of the treatments to 60 NEG. Bottom line is, we saw no difference in performance with average daily gain between rolled corn, whole corn, or sweet bran versus wet distillers. They all performed equally, no difference. So the 50 cents, 100 or whatever, it costs to go to the co-op to process the corn, to dry roll the corn. Guess what? You don't have to do it. Now, you get up to the seven, I'm going to say 800 pounds and greater, you need to process the corn. But for growing calves, they do a really good job of breaking down those kernels and getting as much as they possibly can out of that corn. And with limit feeding, you expect the corn to be in the system longer, right? I told you earlier, there's a 
the passage rate is slowed down significantly. Efficiency of gain is also equal. We saw no byproduct effect, no corn processing effect, and, and there was no interaction as well. So we concluded that sweet bran, wet distillers, equals similar performance, no impacts on health. Now, we did that draw trial, we reeled them back to 2% of their intake. We feel pretty comfortable now. We like 2.2. We think that's the sweet spot uh, for the work that we've done. We also, a lot of people, uh, to answer this question, how much feed intake do you do with these limit-fed calves? We took a real set of fancy heifers out of Chinook, Montana. These calves weighed about, about 460 pounds. Uh, we did it for about 49 days. And what we did is we fed the 60 NEG diet, but what we did was we only offered 1.9, 2.2, 2.5, and even 2.7%. With a high energy diet and a lot of intake, there's what we call a chemostatic feedback in the brain. In other words, it's kind of like having five banana splits and by the time you finish eating three, your body is telling you that you've had enough. You're getting that feedback that you've been satiated, you're no longer hungry. But we fed at the daily gain, excuse me, what did I do? The daily gain, as you would expect, increased linearly from 2.16 to 2.76. Dry matter intake increased, and yet we, you would think that with the higher amount of feed, uh, we saw comparable feed efficiencies. Now, we followed up with another study in September, two years ago, almost, with steers. We locked them in at 2.2%. And I want to show you the compare. You know, this, this whole feeding system is based upon NRC. Okay? NRC just turned 50 years old last summer. It's been around a long time. You can talk to any of the nutritionists around here. That is our nutrition Bible that we use. The formulas, the, the, the means by which we predict and project animal performance works pretty darn good. Really good. We targeted steers at 2.2% of their weight. And using, again, another trial looking at whole shelled corn versus dry rolled corn. And steers you would anticipate to gain a lot more than heifers. So here 2.43 versus 2.39. Uh, very predictable. And, you know, the next question I get from folks is what happens in the feed yard? Uh, you, do you shrink their guts down so much that they really have no capacity to gain? Uh, how about liver abscesses? Are you guys creating problems in the growing phase and is it going to ultimately crash down on the feeders uh, as they deal with these calves? Well, I will tell you, Pratt has never come out and said, hey, uh, there's a problem here. We don't like whatever you guys are doing up there with our cattle. Uh, we do communicate very closely with them. But this study, we just killed our second set of our light cattle here about two weeks ago. This is the heavy set of calves that we follow through the, the feedlot, okay? Um, the 45 NEG, the 60 NEG, you can see there's our improvement in efficiency. 672 versus 844 did very well. There's our gain improvement. And so those calves come off test about 30 pounds heavier than the roughage fed calves. Now what happens in the feedlot? Those calves come off. They're off test here, 890 versus 853. We saw some compensation with the ad lib calves, the 45 NEG. And again, you saw a bit of a reversal with feed efficiency. Dry matter intake was not, uh, was not different, but you could see the difference in average daily gain through the feedlot phase. So, it's a matter, we're working with uh, the Ag Economist with this project, Dr. Glenn Tonzer. Uh, he has a graduate student that's working on this. And we want to put all this information together so you can evaluate the corn market. Everything is taken into consideration. And you can add the pluses and subtract the negatives. And at the end of the day, you get a better idea. Um, here's what happened with carcass merit. Again, I haven't even, we haven't even touched the data. It's being analyzed as I speak. This is raw data. But you can see here, the, there's two columns for each treatment, okay? There's the number of head and the percent of the group for the 60 and the 45. You can see that uh, there's, what, 
five more CABs in the 60 NEG diet. And then as you, you see a slight increase in yield grade threes as well as yield grade fours, all this stuff is going to have to be digested and boiled down to answer questions. But in terms of dialing performance, as I alluded to earlier with NRC, set of calves, I showed you that, that from uh, September of 2018, if you get a good accurate in weight with these calves, you can dial accordingly and they just grow magically. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. It, it does work very, very well. Now, a little bit about the marketing aspect. Uh, how am I doing, Greg, with time? Am I doing okay? Okay, good. So value of gain. What is the value of gain that you put on a calf? And boy, I tell you what, I have the utmost respect for our folks over in Ag Econ. Those guys are sharp cats. They developed this, this piece of software called beefbasis.com. They worked with some of their former students and they built this. And it allows you to go in, and I'm using this simple example of buying a five weight calf out of Joplin and I want to add 300 pounds to that calf. Uh, if I want to gain at 1.88, uh, it's, the value of gain for that calf is about $93 or per head about 278. If I want to buy a four weight calf, if I could find them, and I want to add them still to 800 pounds, I can simulate this and I can get an idea of when the best opportunity is for me to uh, try to figure out what level of gain I can. And based upon the NRC and limit feeding, you can dial it in and, and you can shoot for that timeline. And this is all based upon corn futures and, and the feeder futures too. So there's some good stuff. So based on what I just put together last week for, for this seminar, for this presentation, uh, which weight class is the better deal? Uh, a four weight uh, purchased, uh, I went into March versus uh, a five weight. Total dollars expended, you're spending about another uh, $100 for a five weight calf. You're selling uh, the four weights on September and earlier for the five weight calves weighing eight pounds. So daily gain, uh, I'm just going through this here real quickly. Value of gain, 98 bucks versus 93 bucks. And it all takes into consideration that uh, the class of calf that you have. Now, our extension service utilizes a piece of software uh, from Iowa State. It's called Brands. It's part of our nutrition uh, evaluation. And as I alluded to earlier, in terms of putting calves in and having a good accurate weight, it, it, this worksheet actually does it for you based upon the nutrient, whatever the, the ration that you're feeding for limit feeding. But it tells you how much you need to increase the amount of feed for that calf as you take it through the days on feed with that animal. Works pretty cool. So, I'm at the end of my presentation. Uh, limit feeding, it's been around a long time. And I think with the environmental situations and stuff, I think it, it deserves a look at in some of your situations. Uh, the low roughage inclusion can be a positive in times of drought. Uh, we were buying $150 prairie hay back in the, the last drought that we experienced up there in Manhattan. And, prairie, and, and alfalfa, hmm. yeah, that was, that was not very fun either. Uh, improved market planning, as I showed you with the beef basis, big plus, I think, uh, you know, to keep, keep those folks in the cities that are so concerned about that is that we reduce the manure output, we improve feed efficiency. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work looking at improved health detection. And, of course, I want to leave with you a big part of this is the inclusion of co-products in these limit feed diets that I've shared with you today. So with that, I would welcome any questions. Be happy to visit. Dale? Yes, sir. When those cattle go to prep feeders coming off from your higher energy diet, do they change what starting ration they use or are they going back to the They went exactly to what the feed yard typically used. The only thing we did was we monitored the rations that they were, and they all got the same. The only difference we did, Paul, was that we had a heavy end sort and a light end sort to fit the pen. So we only had, we had two reps for, for, uh, for each treatment. It seemed like an advantage they could start at a higher. You would, you would think, but again, that, that, that consultant and that same consultant working with the backgrounder and having the confidence to follow through into the finish you would think you could shave off some days on feed, right? I mean, you can get them up there a lot quicker and move on. But we didn't do that.
We worked within the constraints of reality. Yeah. But uh, we got, uh, uh, we had West Texas A&M come up and do our liver scores. We're, we're trying to get our, the whole picture in terms of the, of the, of the room and health of that animal. Uh, so we feel fairly comfortable and confident with what we're doing at them at this lighter stage of their life. Any questions? Yes, sir. That's to do with the kind of off the limit picking topic, but the whole corn, roll the corn, um, supplementing cattle that are on grass. Um, I know it's kind of off this topic, but does that follow through to supplementation and daily gain? Is there any difference there on, say, feeding one percent on fescue, for example? Uh, and feeding it as whole versus rolled? Uh, that's a good question. I, 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 I wouldn't, with the size of calves that I addressed, I wouldn't see that as a problem if, if you got, or you got bunks out there too, right? You're not just ground pouring it and... Right. Well, it's not just 1% whole corn, it's a mix. But it's a mix. But as far as performance, are you seeing a performance difference in the rolled and whole? I wouldn't expect with that class of animal, no. There's sufficient, uh, a lot of, they regurgitate their feed. The animals do a better job of breaking stuff down. I mean, uh, we got some stuff published uh, specifically looking at that topic. And it, again, that's not something new that we've, I mean, you go back to Oklahoma State. I mean, you can go back to Wagner's old work and stuff. A lot of whole shell corn being fed, but to lighter calf classes of animals. And on grass, and I'm, I might invite Paul to, to speak about that as he gets up later on in the presentation about uh, feeding it as a whole versus uh, potential. I mean, if you do a good job with the mix, the sorting, that'd be maybe a concern one might have. Reduction in dust might be better too. Uh, rain events or anything like that, you think they do a better job of picking up? I wouldn't, I wouldn't anticipate a big difference if there was one. Okay. How much bunk space are you recommending on a 500 pounds to eliminate competition? Uh, 18 to 20 inches. We, we don't lack for bunk space at the stalker unit. Uh, for the size, we, we got 12 head pens is what we use for that calf. And of course, as they get bigger, uh, we put fewer animals in there. But with, with what we're doing with the limit feeding, they all have to get there shoulder to shoulder. They better have adequate space, especially if there's any dominance issues that are being worked through with these uh, calves from being commingled and stuff from other sources. Yes, sir. I was looking at this carcass uh, merit slide there. Um, it shows a, a 10% increase in yield rate. Yep. 